super fascinating. Google's Willow Chip. I've got a stack of dense technical papers here, and I'm really glad to have our expert here to help break it all down. Oh, absolutely. It's a hot topic and for good reason. Right. I mean, this is the kind of tech that could completely change the game. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start with the basics. I kept seeing this term quibits pop up everywhere in these documents. Ah, uh, yes. The heart of quantum computing. So can you like explain it to me like I'm five? All right. Think of it this way. In regular computers, we use bits, right? Zero or one, on or off. Yeah, like a light switch. Exactly. But a quibit, it's more like a dimmer switch. It could be zero, one, or somewhere in between, all at the same time. Whoa, so it's not just on or off, it's like both. Yeah, we call that superposition. And that's what gives quantum computers their edge. Because a quibit can be in multiple states at once, it can explore tons of possibilities simultaneously. It's mind-bogglingly powerful. Okay, now that's impressive, but I also stumbled upon this thing called a quantum key coherence, and it sounds like a major party pooper. Yeah, that's the big challenge. You see these qubits? They're super sensitive. Any little disturbance, temperature change, vibration, noise, anything really can knock them out of that superposition state. And when that happens, poof, there goes your quantum advantage. Oh, so it's like they're easily distracted. Kind of, yeah. And that's what makes building stable quantum computers so hard. Which brings us back to Google's Willow chip. So is that what sets it apart, how it deals with this whole stability issue? Absolutely. One of Willow's big claims to fame is the type of qubit it uses. These are called transmon qubits. And they're designed to be a lot more resistant to this decoherence problem. They're laid out in this two-dimensional grid. And one of the key features is something called a Josephson Junction. Ah, Josephson Junction. It sounds like we're getting into some serious sci-fi territory now. It might sound like something straight out of Star Trek, but I promise it's a real thing. Basically, imagine two superconductors separated by this super thin insulator. Okay, got it. Two superconductors, a tiny barrier between them. Now, because of the crazy world of quantum mechanics, Electrons can actually tunnel right through that insulator. Wait, so they're jumping through a wall they shouldn't be able to cross. Yep, it's wild, right? And by using these Josephson junctions in transpond quivets, we get very precise control over the quivets energy levels. And that control, that's one of the things that makes them way less sensitive to noise and helps them hold on to their quantum state for longer. Aha, uh -huh, so that's how they stay focused. These Josephson junctions, they're like the secret weapon against decoherence. You got it. But there's another piece to the puzzle here. Willow also boasts some pretty incredible error correction capabilities. It can actually detect and fix errors as they happen. Oh, I saw that mentioned in the document, something about error correction being super important for quantum computing. But why is that such a big deal? Well, in our everyday computers, error correction happens all the time. We just don't see it. But in the quantum world, things are way more fragile. Remember those super sensitive quibits? Any tiny error can throw off the whole calculation. So if we want quantum computers to be truly useful, we need rock-solid error correction to keep things on track. So Willow has some serious error correction skills, and from what I read, it uses something called a surface code. You're right on the money, the surface code. That's where things get really interesting. Okay, so last time we left off on this cliffhanger about the surface code. You said it's how Willow tackles error correction, right? Right. It's a pretty ingenious technique. Imagine a flat grid, yeah like a checkerboard where each square is a quibit. Okay, I can picture that. Now, instead of just using one quibit to store information, the surface code spreads it out over a bunch of these physical quibits. They all work together to make what we call a logical quibit. So it's like distributing the data, right? Like having backups in case something goes wrong. That's a good way to think about it. The quibits are all linked together, entangled, in this special way that creates redundancy. So if one of those physical quibits has an error, it doesn't actually mess up the overall information. Oh, I see. So the information is protected because it's not all in one place. But how does it even know if there's an error in the first place? Well, remember we talked about those stabilizer operators. They come in handy here. Yeah, those were the things that check on the quibits without messing with their state. Exactly. We use them to make special measurements on groups of quibits. These measurements don't change the information, but they can tell us if something fishy is going on. So they're like little alarms going off if something's wrong. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And Based on what these measurements tell us, we get these things called syndromes. Syndromes. Yeah, think of them like patterns that pop up, giving us clues about what kind of error happened and where it happened. Oh, so it's like a detective story. We've got the clues, but now we need to solve the case. How do we use these syndromes to fix the errors? This is where a very smart algorithm steps in called minimum weight perfect matching. It's a mouthful, I know. We can just call it MWPM. Right, MWPM. So this MWPM algorithm looks at those syndromes, those patterns, 
and tries to figure out the most likely error that caused them. Like it's connecting the dots. Exactly. And once it figures out what probably went wrong, it tells the system how to fix those specific quibits. So it's constantly detecting and correcting errors, like on the fly. That's right. And that's a big reason why Willow is causing such a stir. It's showing us that this kind of real-time error correction, it's not just a theory anymore. It can actually be done. And that's huge for building bigger, more powerful quantum computers in the future. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned earlier that the surface code is good at handling different types of errors, right? Can you tell me more about that? Sure. There are two main types of errors in quantum computers, bid flip errors and face flip errors. Bid flips sound pretty self-explanatory, like flipping a zero to a one, but face flip. Yeah, that one's a little trickier. Think of a quibit, like a wave. It has this thing called phase, which is basically where it is in its cycle. Okay, so like a wave going up and down. Exactly. And a phase flip error is like shifting that wave along its cycle, but not changing how high it goes. Oh, so it's like moving the wave forward or backward, but keeping its shape the same. Precisely. It's a bit abstract, but the point is, these phase errors can mess things up just as much as bit flip errors. So how does the surface code handle both of these? That's one of its best features. It uses different sets of stabilizer operators to catch both bit flip and phase flip errors. It's like having two sets of eyes, one watching for each type. Pretty clever. So to recap, Willow has these transmon qubits arranged on a grid, and it uses this surface code to protect the information from errors. Sounds like a winning combo. It definitely is. And don't forget those transmon qubits, they have their own advantages too. Right. You mentioned something about them having a longer coherence times before. What does that even mean? It basically means how long a qubit can hold on to its quantum state, its superposition, before it gets messed up by decoherence. And transmon qubits, they can hold on for quite a bit longer than some other types. So it's like they have better concentration. Exactly. The longer they stay in that superposition state, the more we can do with them. It's a key factor in building practical quantum computers. Wow, so we've got those tiny Josephson junctions helping with stability, the surface code fighting off errors, and these transmon quibits with their long coherence times. It really seems like Willow is pushing the boundaries of what's possible. It really is. And these advances, they're what's making everyone so excited about the potential of quantum computing to tackle real-world problems. Okay, so we spent the last two parts getting pretty deep into the weeds of how Willow works, all the technical stuff. But now I want to talk about what it can actually do. Like, what are the real-world implications of all this? The articles you sent over hinted at some pretty amazing possibilities. Yeah, quantum computing is poised to really shake things up in a lot of industries. One area that's particularly exciting is optimization problems. Optimization problems. Right, these are problems where you're trying to find, like, the best solution out of a ton of different options. Okay, can you give me an example so I can wrap my head around it? Sure. Imagine a company with a fleet of delivery trucks. They need to figure out the most efficient routes for all those trucks to deliver their packages. That's an optimization problem. Or think about designing a complex manufacturing process with all sorts of variables and steps. So you're trying to find the most efficient way to do something, but there are just way too many possibilities to figure it out easily. Exactly. For regular computers, those kinds of problems become practically impossible to solve perfectly. They just can't handle that many calculations. But quantum computers, with their ability to explore all those possibilities at the same time, they can tackle these problems much more effectively. So we're talking about like faster deliveries, less wasted resources, that kind of thing. Absolutely. And it goes way beyond logistics and manufacturing. Think about finance, optimizing investment portfolios. That could be revolutionized by quantum computing. Wow. Okay. So what about some of those other applications? Like I remember reading about drug discovery and material science. Yeah, those are some really exciting areas. Right now, it's super hard for regular computers to simulate how molecules behave at a really detailed level. But quantum computers could change that. We could simulate how molecules interact, and that could lead to like totally new drugs and materials with crazy properties. I'm trying to picture how that would work in practice. Okay, imagine designing a drug to fight a specific disease. With quantum simulation, you could see exactly how that drug would interact with the body at the molecular level. That means you could design much more targeted and effective treatments. Or think about simulating how electrons behave in different materials. That could lead to breakthroughs in like solar energy or stronger, lighter materials for building things. It's like having a microscope that can see and manipulate matter at the tiniest level. It is. And it opens up so many possibilities, not just in medicine and materials, but in chemistry, physics, energy research. The list goes on. It's pretty mind blowing. And then there's AI, right? Artificial intelligence. That was another big area that came up in these articles. Oh, yeah. Quantum machine learning has the potential to be huge, even though it's still early days. We could create algorithms that analyze data in ways we can't even imagine right now. Think about pattern recognition, 
image processing, all sorts of areas where AI is used. So we could have AI systems that are way more powerful than anything we have now. Potentially, yeah. We're still figuring out how to harness that power, but the possibilities are huge. And of course, we can't talk about quantum computing without mentioning cybersecurity. Yeah, that's the big elephant in the room. There's that concern that quantum computers could break the encryption we use for everything online. It's a valid concern. A lot of our current encryption relies on math problems that are hard for regular computers, but a powerful enough quantum computer could crack them. So does that mean all our data is going to be vulnerable? Not necessarily. Researchers are already working on what we call quantum-resistant cryptography, encryption that can stand up to quantum computers. It's a bit of an arms race, but a lot of smart people are on it. So it's like a double-edged sword. Quantum computers could be a threat to cybersecurity, but also a potential solution. Exactly. It highlights just how powerful this technology is. But I think overall, the potential benefits are immense. Well, this has been a fascinating deep dive. I feel like I've learned so much, not just about Willow specifically, but about the whole field of quantum computing. It really is an exciting time to be following this technology. I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. Thanks so much for guiding us through all this. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the world of Google's Willow chip and the future of quantum computing. It's definitely something to keep an eye on.